Okay, having said that, okay, now we get to premise nine. Well, we almost get to premise nine. We'll be at premise nine in just a second, which is that um, I was doing a talk one time. I did two talks in the same town on the same day, and this one woman hated what I had to say so much that she came to both talks. <laughs> and she accused me of being a combination of Mao, Pol Pot, and Stalin because I want to bring down civilization. And her logic is that, I hit the trifecta, and um, the logic was that because I want to bring down civilization, I want to kill a lot of people. Therefore, I'm like Mao, Pol Pot, and Stalin. And I didn't like her rhetoric. And, you know, I am not nearly as smart as my books make me seem. Because in my books, I have all these conversations with friends where, where the friend will say something really smart, and I say something really smart back, and then the friend says something really smart. That's not how it happened. <laughs> what really happened is my friend says something really smart. I say, wow, that's really smart. And then I call them back in like a month. And then... Um, they say something really smart right away, and then I call them back in another month. And so that night, I had no idea. It was like, she said, you're a combination of Mao, Pol Pot, and Stalin. And I said, oh, yeah? <laughs> well, what, is, what are you then? And, um, and, uh, but, but later, I came up with a bunch of answers for her, which I'm now going to inflict on you. And um, the first answer is that, I mean, her, her basic point is that bringing down civilization is going to kill a lot of people. And my first answer is that if you participate in the global economy, your hands are blood red. You've got blood all over your hands. If you don't participate in the global economy, but you allow it to continue, your hands are blood red. If you bring it down, your hands are blood red. We're in a bad situation, in the middle of an exploitative situation, and doing nothing is not a moral answer. And so you can't get on a moral high horse for someone who wants to stop that situation. That's nice, Derek, but that's an alter the fact that bringing down civilization is going to kill a lot of people. So my next answer is that my definition of bringing down civilization is I want to deprive the rich of their ability to steal from the poor, and I want to deprive the powerful of their ability to destroy the planet. Nobody but a capitalist or a sociopath, insofar as there's a difference, could argue with that. Which doesn't alter the fact that bringing down civilization is going to kill a lot of people. Including me, by the way. Um, I have Crohn's disease, and I'm dependent for my life upon high-tech medicine. So when I talk about bringing down civilization, this is not some abstract thing. I will be dead six months maximum. But I also understand that the health of the land base is more important than any human life, including my own. Well, that's nice, Derek, but a lot of people are going to die. So I got another answer, which is bringing down civilization is not a monolithic act. It's a bazillion different acts done by a bazillion different people with a bazillion different moralities. And I mean, for example, you cannot make, and they all have different, different moralities. You, you cannot make a moral case for blowing up a children's hospital. You can't do it. I don't care. Oh, yeah, you can. If you're bringing freedom and democracy to a country, then you can. Um, <laughs> You can't make a moral case. I don't care if you're an anarcho-primitivist or if you are a capitalist or if you are anything else. Blowing up a children's hospital is an atrocity. I don't care. <clears throat> On the other hand, I don't think you can make an argument against taking out cell phone towers. You cannot make a moral argument against taking out cell phone towers. And, that's, that's, and the reason cell phone towers, taking them out, is really important is there's a bunch of reasons. First off, they allow the asshole at the next table to yammer on when you're trying to eat. Have you noticed that? You know, i got to tell you, times have changed because I've been complaining about this for 15 years and back when I used to complain about it, everybody in the whole audience is like, they'd already grab pitchforks. It's like, yeah, I hate it when those fuckers at the next table. And then about eight years ago, it's like, yeah, it's bad. And by now it's like, what's your deal, man? Yeah, who gives a shit? Um, okay, that's one reason. Another reason that cell phone towers are really bad is because they put out those, um, yeah, electromagnetic dealy bobs. And then they, they go, they go like this. That's the scientific explanation. Um, they go like this, and they get in your head, and they, then they bounce back and forth, and you've got to put on the aluminum beanie, and if you put it on wrong side out, then it, well, that doesn't happen to you. Um, okay, so the third reason they're really bad <laughs> is because they kill between 5 and 50 million migratory songbirds every year. They're major killers of migratory songbirds. And... Anyway, you cannot make a moral case against taking out a cell phone tower. Um, 
That's nice, Derek. But as you bring down civilization, a lot of people are going to die. Well, my next answer is, which people are you talking about? Are you talking about hammerhead shark people? Are you talking about salmon people? Are you talking about monarch butterfly people? Um, if you were to ask polar bears if we should bring down civilization, they would say, uh, yeah. Um, and if you ask prairie dogs if we should bring down civilization, they would say, yep, 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 yep. But they don't count right because they're just non-human, so they're not real people, right? Um, okay, well, fine. Which people are you talking about? Years ago, I interviewed Anurata Mita, former director of Food First, and I asked her, would the people of India be better off if the global economy disappeared tomorrow? And she laughed and said, of course, poor people the world over would be better off immediately. Would subsistence farmers in India be better off if they weren't being forced off their land? Um, there are former granaries of, of India that now export dog food and tulips to Europe. So would those people be better off without, what about the people in Africa whose land is being grabbed by the Chinese right now or by the Europeans? What about the people in Jamaica who are being forced into doing cash crops for export as opposed to subsistence farming? What about the people in the Zinku River who are fighting the Belo Monte Dam? You know, it's like, which people are you talking about? Um, I think we can break people into four basic groups for that. I think around the world, um, the rural poor all over the world would be better off. The people who don't have electricity right now, what do they care if the grid goes down? The people the world over, the rural poor, would be better off because nobody would be stealing their land. The rural rich would be fine. They've got guns. The urban rich, they're the problem. Fuck them. The urban poor, that's a problem. And part of the reason it's a problem is because we have been all made dependent upon the very system that's exploiting us. So I go back and forth with the urban poor. As a po would, the, would the urban poor be worse off if the, if the whole system came down? On one hand, I think yes, because they're dependent, like Egypt is dependent upon food, importing lots of food. But on the other hand, if you want to talk about instant land reform, stop immediate military support of all these dictatorships. And which side you, I mean, honestly, if I have a choice between a thousand poor people with machetes or 50 people with guns that only have five bullets apiece, it's like if you stop the flow of weapons to the rich, you're going to get instant land reform. That's all nice, Derek, but it doesn't alter the fact that a lot of people are going to die. Um, and this is also a really important reason. Thing, this whole thing about being dependent upon the system that's exploiting us, one of the reasons that we don't fight back is because if your experience is that your food comes from a grocery store and your water comes from the tap, you will defend to the death the system that brings those to you, even if it's exploitative. If, on the other hand, your food comes from a land base and your water comes from a river, you will defend to the death those because your life depends on it. One of the brilliant things that the culture has done has been to insert itself between us and the source of life. This is intentional. This is what any good abusive system does. Why There are a lot of abused women who stick around with the abusers because they've got children and they have no source of income. This is my mother in the 1950s and 60s. And this is what a system does. And it's not just abusers. It's also, there was a great line by um, the southern pro-slavery philosopher in the 1830s. He said, he was talking to his northern abolitionist capitalist buddy. And he said, that there are land ownership conditions in which it's in the capitalist's best interest to own slaves and there are land ownership conditions which is the capitalist's best interest to not own slaves. It's very simple. If you have a lot of land and not many people, then people have access to land, which means they have access to food, clothing, and shelter, which means they have access to, self, to self-sufficiency, which means the only way you can get them to work for you is at the point of a gun. On the other hand, if you have a lot of people and not much land, that means they don't have access to land, which means they don't have access to food, clothing, and shelter, which means they don't have access to self-sufficiency, which means that they have to go to work for you at whatever pittance you want to pay them. This is intentional. This is, this is why indigenous peoples are consistently dispossessed. This is why the poor are dispossessed, to force them into the economy. How else are you going to get them to work for Monsanto or Apple or whatever else? And there's a great line by uh, Onondaga uh, 
firekeeper, um, Orrin Lyons, who says, there is no sovereignty without food sovereignty. Food is the basis of everything. It's like years ago, I interviewed a member of the Tupac Amaristas, a rebel group in Peru, the MRTA. And I said, what do you want for the people of Peru? And he said, we want to be able to grow and distribute our own food. We merely need to be allowed to do so. That's the entire struggle right there. That's it. That's everything. And that's all nice, Derek, but a lot of people are going to die. So my next answer is, I guarantee that as civilization collapses, 100% of the misery will be caused by those whose lifestyles are causing this misery attempting to maintain their lifestyles. The poor are being impoverished because it's like, what, 70% of famines historically have happened not... The countries that experience famines are generally still net exporters of food. The people in the Irish potato famine, Ireland was exporting grain to England. They're not dying of famine. They're not dying of starvation. They're dying of colonialism. And it's the same with water. We always hear all the time, you know, oh, you know, the world's running out of water. The world's running out of water. Bullshit. The world's not running out of water. Fucking bullshit. Goddamn George Bush, Barack Obama fucking bullshit. It's, the world's not running out of water. What's happening is the water's being stolen. 90% of the water being used is used for agriculture and industry. People say, oh my God, take shorter showers. You've got to do all this personal stuff to change everything. Take shorter showers. All it's going to do is ruin your social life. Um, <laughs> the same amount of water is used by municipal human beings as is used for municipal golf courses. So if you want to save water, you want to take a shorter shower or you want to take out a golf course? I mean, which, which, which is more useful? And one of the things they've done is they've convinced us that we are consumers and not citizens and not human animals who need habitat. In the 1980s was the first time that um, corporate newspapers called human beings consumers more often than citizens. And this is really crucial because if they can get you to identify as a consumer, your choices of resistance are buy or not buy. If, on the other hand, you're a citizen, your choices of resistance are buy, not buy, organize, boycott, um, when a government becomes destructive of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. You can revolt. That's a huge transformation that we should not allow ourselves to buy into. But it goes even further than that because if you go back a few thousand years, there was another transformation where we went from being human animals who need community and habitat to being citizens of a state. And that transformation involves many things, including one of the classic things in sociology is that if you're a citizen of a state, you grant the state a monopoly on violence. <coughs> we forget that we are animals who need habitat and whose families are being poisoned, and we forget that we are animals with teeth and claws. And that's all nice, Derek, but um, this is all really... Um, that's great, wonderful, but um, a lot of people are going to die. So I have another answer, which is that... Um, if you've gotten this far in this talk or if you're simply, any, simply anything other than entirely insensate, we probably agree that civilization is going to crash, whether or not we help bring it about. If you don't agree with this, we probably have not much to say to each other. How about them cubbies? We probably also agree that the crash will be messy. We agree further that since industrial civilization is systematically dismantling the ecological infrastructure of the planet, the sooner it comes down, whether or not we help it crash, the more life will remain afterwards to support both humans and non-humans. If you agree with that, and if you don't want to dirty your spirituality and conscience with the physical work of helping to bring down civilization. And if your primary concern really is for the well-being of those humans who will be alive during and immediately after the crash, then given, and I repeat this point to emphasize it, the civilization is going to come down anyway, you need to start preparing people for the crash. Instead of coming to my talks and attacking me for stating the obvious, go rip up asphalt and vacant parking lots to convert them to neighborhood gardens. Go teach people how to identify local edible plants, even in the city, especially in the city, so these people won't starve when the proverbial shit hits the fan they can no longer head off to Albertsons for groceries. Set up committees to eliminate or, if appropriate, channel the additional violence that might break out. Okay, we're going to take a timeout. Not a timeout like we're leaving, but a timeout because I want to change the subject for a second.